which Corrine owned Broken Ground, a permaculture education and design business here in Bozeman. She teaches workshops online and in person. She blogs and she writes magazine articles. She and her family live on a three-quarter acre suburban homestead with large-scale kitchen gardens, a food forest, a greenhouse, a pond, and chickens. We're so lucky to have her wit, her, her commentary, and good humor to bring us through this evening. And she is such a perfect host for an Arrow event as she lives the solutions she wants to see in the world. So let's welcome her here. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Uh, thank you so much, Lindsay, for the introduction. I was honored uh, to have been asked by Arrow to MC this event. Because um, when I'm not growing food, or eating food, or teaching other people how to grow food, I love talking about local food systems and how to make our communities more resilient. So uh, this seemed like a great way to support that conversation uh, and to move that conversation forward. But let's just get this out of the way. I am not a professional MC. Uh, if, for those of you who are from Bozeman, I am definitely no Missy O'Malley, so don't expect that from me. I'm basically a gardener who's taken the leaves and sticks out of her hair, put on some slightly nicer clothing, and I'm going to just guide you through this evening and introduce you to some pretty amazing speakers. Uh, so it's nice to see some familiar faces here and some new faces. How many of you are from out of town? Awesome. Can we just see, say where? Summers. Awesome. Awesome. So awesome. Did I hear Alaska? Yeah. Awesome. Great. And who here participated in the tours today? Yeah. Nice. Got a lot out of those? Yeah. Great, awesome. Yes. Thank you to Errol for doing that. Um, so this evening and this weekend's conference is about food and food systems. And food is what connects all of us. Uh, whether you're concerned about your health, whether you're concerned about the health of your community, uh, whether you're wanting to conserve agricultural land, or you're concerned about access to food, uh, or you're concerned about climate change. Learning about and participating in the food system is, I think, one of the best and most positive things that we can do right now. Um, so, but food systems are complex. So I was at the Gallatin Valley Tour today, and we met producers, we met uh, processors, we met distributors. It's really complex, it takes a lot of people, and if we want to build a community-based, equitable, sustainable, functional local food system is going to take all of us. And that's what this evening is about. So you're going to hear from a diversity of different speakers this evening, and we're certainly not going to cover all that you need to know about the local food system. Definitely, if you're here, how many of you are here and are going to stay for this weekend's conference? Awesome, great. So if you're here on Saturday and Sunday, a lot of these speakers are going to be part of panels, they're going to be part of um, the, the the sessions, um, but we, but for those of you who aren't, this is just a smattering of different ideas, stories, innovations, and ways that we can address uh, local food. So, so as you heard, Lindsay said, this evening was promoted as a Pachakcha style event. Who's been to a Pachakcha event? So somebody, who doesn't know what I'm talking about? <laughs> okay, so Pachakcha or Pechakucha, or I don't know quite how to say it. Um, it's a Japanese word that means chit-chat. And basically, it was, in, it was invented uh, by two architects in Japan, in Tokyo in 2003. And it's a format of 20 slides and 20 seconds per slide. So every speaker is gonna come up here, and they're gonna, have, they're gonna go through 20, 20 slides, and they're gonna have 20 seconds each to talk about those slides. So the whole presentation is only going to be six minutes and 40 seconds. So it's going to be quick, it's going to be light. Some of the speakers that we have are seasoned Pachakcha, our youngest speaker, Zachary Rochiller, is a seasoned Pachakcha speaker. <laughs> some, of, some of the other speakers, though they might be seasoned 
and public speakers um, have less experience. So we're going to support them. This is an exciting opportunity. And it's a really great way just to get a bunch of different information uh, in a short amount of time. I think the architects invented it as an antidote to the death by PowerPoint presentation type of situation that I'm sure some students can identify with. So, um, so let's see. Silence your cell phones, everybody. Uh, if you can, I invite you to be present uh, for these talks. And let's get on with the show. So with our first speaker. So, okay. I will start with Zach's introduction, or how are we doing over there, Kate? in the Montana House of Representatives in 2014 at the age of 23. He is currently serving his third consecutive term representing the people of House District 63, which includes Montana State University's campus and university district. His committee work focuses primarily on taxation, wildlife management, and he is the chairman of the Water Policy Committee. Of possible interest to this crowd is his recent legislation to create a student loan assistance program for beginning farmers and ranchers. Zach also works a day job at One Montana, tackling tough issues across the rural-urban divide, including rural economic development, teen entrepreneurship, mental health, climate adaptation, and landowner sportsmen's relations. He completed undergraduate studies at the University of Montana, led a research project at Georgetown University focused on US immigration policy reform, and loves to work on issues ranging from the opioid policy to criminal justice reform and wildlife management to water, water policy. He is happiest when fishing for cutthroat trout or white fish in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem with his fiance Alice and their two dogs, or hunting the badlands of eastern Montana with his brother and dad. Please help me welcome this inspiring young Montanan with his talk, Gratitude, you can't change systems or minds without first saying thank you. Thank you very much. It's a good way to start a uh, talk about gratitude. So, yeah, go ahead. The premise of my talk tonight is to say that uh, when we're talking about or thinking about how to change systems, how to change people's minds on tough issues that are important to all of us here tonight, uh, and a really powerful frame and a <clears throat> way to approach people that may think about things differently than you is to just lead by saying thank you. Welcome them into the solution space. Uh, the, one of the first people that got me thinking about this is this man, uh, Bob Inglis. He's a Republican um, uh, congressman from South Carolina. He spoke uh, a few years ago on this stage. And part of his message was he, he, he's a leader in the space of trying to get Republicans and conservatives to think about climate solutions. And he, he makes the point that often uh, liberals, I'm a Democrat, um, uh, have made conservatives feel like uh, that they, they're cornered into being, uh, having to wear the dunce cap when it comes to climate solutions, that they have to admit and say, yes, I was right and you were wrong. And the premise of this talk is to say, let's imagine a better way where we don't ask our our friends and neighbors to wear a dense cap, but let's welcome them into that space of solutions and honor them. This is a picture of Coal Strip, as you all know. It embolizes our fossil fuel industry in Montana, and regardless of your perspective, it is emblematic of change. That community is going through a transition. And my challenge to all of you is thinking about when we, when we grapple with these issues and we talk with people from these communities, what if the first thing we do is look people like this in the eye and just say, thank you. Thank you for all the things that the coal industry has provided, for all those middle class, blue collar jobs that put food on the table for families. Thank you for reliable, affordable energy. Thank you from the state of Montana's point of view for bailing us out of uh, financial issues over the years, for funding things through the Coal Trust Fund, like infrastructure, arts, and culture. By the way, that money will fund those programs into perpetuity as long as this state is around. And so when we think about all these, all these changes and some of the challenges that come with these changes, the closure of Units 1 and 2 is the most uh, poignant thing at the moment that's in the news, and it's a big topic of discussion in the legislature and has been over my three terms. And it's given me an opportunity, for whatever it's worth, 
to find some common ground with this man, who is a Republican senator from Colstrip. And you might wonder what a Democrat from Bozeman has uh, in common with a Republican from Colstrip, which might as well be, uh, Colstrip and Bozeman might as well be different planets. And I hope, if nothing else, what we have in common is that we respect each other. And I think that I hope that I've proven that to him over, over time and over our six years working together. Now, thinking about agriculture as it's facing a transition. Um, first, again, instead of pointing a finger at folks that maybe we feel are doing things wrong, can't we think about the fact that this industry has always been in transition? And it's overcome so many challenges and come from such a challenging place. And so when you talk about climate change, perhaps a way to start that conversation is honoring the past and saying, wow, we've gotten to a place from the Dust Bowl to today where we're able to feed the world and have a food system that in many respects is the envy of the world. Yes, there are problems, but leading with those problems and wagging our fingers is perhaps not the best way to bring people into that space where they can think about um, how, to, how to change their hearts, their minds, their practices on their agricultural operation. And, and pointing out problems doesn't honor the fact that agriculture, as you all well know, can be an incredible part of the climate solution. And so this is a picture of a Greek hero, Cadmus. It's just to, to say that in, in Greek mythology and in heroes, uh, in every, every part of our culture, what is the defining characteristic of a hero? They are all tragically flawed. They make mistakes. <laughs> And Greek mythology shows us this. Batman, my favorite superhero, is just a guy. He's a rich guy. And if you read the comic strips or watch the movies, he makes mistakes. He's a human being, and he's often wrong. So how can we define our relationships with people and start to change hearts and minds and systems by uh, really focusing on this hero narrative and really thinking about how we can help farmers and ranchers who may not be in this room or members of Arrow, but are conventional farmers and ranchers, how can we help them see themselves as part of the solution when it comes to these issues, as, as opposed to wagging our fingers at them and saying, you're the problem. Um, and I think it's just worth saying that part of my work at One Montana and, and on this issue over the years has given me the opportunity to participate in the climate assessment. And that was the premise of every meeting we had with producers with Dr. Maxwell was, Listen, if you all are here today as generational producers, you know how to adapt. You've been, you've been resilient over the years. So what can we learn from you? That is such an inviting way to start a conversation instead of saying the sky is falling and you're the problem. These are some of my favorite people, just to bring it home again. This is Chris and Gary King, ranchers from Winnet, Montana. And they've become close personal friends. And again, you might say, what's a guy from Bozeman have in common with people from Winnet? Well, they're conventional ranchers, they're Republicans. But man, if you even begin to scratch the surface of their operation, uh, and you begin to learn how deeply they think about ecology and wildlife and soils and cover cropping, they're open-minded and inspiring human beings. And how many more heroes like that are there out there who are thinking, about, thinking critically about problems facing agriculture? And by the way, if agriculture divides, divides itself and, begin, and falls uh, prey to the tendencies to infight and point fingers, it's going to fail. Um, there is no industry that is aging as quickly as agriculture. This last thing is to say, OK, well, thanking people and expressing gratitude can help change systems and minds of other people. But it also can change you. Uh, science proves that Expressing gratitude in, uh, increases personal satisfaction, increases your personal motivation and your ability to grapple with complex problems. So that's my challenge to everybody in this room is to say, uh, let's thank each other. And thank you for listening to me, of course, but also let's just be humans and treat each other like humans and, and with, with respect and gratitude. So, Thank you so much, Zach, and for starting us off with that message of gratitude and being grateful and finding common ground. I first met Zach over 10 years ago when he was a high school student, uh, and he was working on the initiative to bring the ozone, ozone greenhouse bus uh, to Bozeman, and it's amazing to see what you've done uh, in just a little over a decade. So I look forward to following you for another decade. Thank you. Uh, so, moving on to another inspiring young person. 
Vanessa Williamson grew up in eastern North Dakota with a family farm not two hours away in Minnesota. Her dad spent many days driving to and from the farm during harvest and planting season with younger Vanessa in tow. Although admittedly never that interested in the farming aspects of the farm, she was more interested in the new baby kittens, driving around on the four-wheeler, and spending time with grandma. She learned early on the importance of a healthy growing season, how every little thing can affect the yield of a crop, and that farm life is hard work. After many family trips to Montana growing up, Vanessa set her sights on MSU and was accepted into the business college where she earned her business marketing degree in 2017. She seems to have put that degree into practice, as you'll probably hear in her talk this evening. Please join me in welcoming Vanessa to the stage with her talk, <coughs> Ugly Vegetables Certified. First of all, I just want to thank you all for coming tonight. Um, as she mentioned, my name is Vanessa Williamson, and I am the co-founder of Farmented Foods, which is a local vegetable fermentation company here in Montana. And I'm here to talk to you all about what it means to be ugly vegetable certified. But first, I want to pose a question. What are the differences between these two carrots? Sure, there is the obvious appearance factor. But if we dig any deeper, can we find any other differences? The same soil, water, and sunlight was used to grow and nourish these crops. The same farmers spent countless hours worrying over their yield. And nutritionally, they are the exact same. Yet we place a higher value on the carrot to your right and many times completely disregard the carrot on the left. And our farmers have no control over how their produce grows. And so wasting carrots or any produce that looks like this carrot isn't just revenue lost, it's, not, it's food lost, it's money lost, it's water lost. But we're taught that our food needs to be perfect, it needs to be pretty. When you go, we go to the store, we look through all the tomatoes to find the perfect one that has no bruises and it's not too ripe. But that leaves so much produce cast aside just because we didn't deem it perfect enough. According to the NRDC, 40% of the food grown in the United States is never eaten. Now while there are many factors that go into this, Farmented Foods was founded to help solve this exact problem I've been talking about the issue of ugly vegetables. And we wanted to do it at the source, with our farmers. Like I said before, our farmers have no control over what their carrots are going to look like or what their yield will be from one year to another. And so all of these ugly and excess crops that are left over have no place to go. And these farmers are losing out on the valuable revenue that could come from them. And in turn, our economy is losing out on those. So, in 2017, my co-founder, Vanessa Walston, and I, yes, we are two Vanessas, we decided we wanted to flip the script. We not only wanted to create a outlet for these ugly crops, but we also wanted to create an additional revenue source for our farmers. And our process is simple. We talk to our farmers. We ask them what are the problem crops when it comes to ugly vegetables. We purchase these. We ferment them into a variety of products, and we distribute them across the state. And it works great. We never stop repeating the process, and our farmers are happy. And we continuously see additional farmers approaching us as an outlet for their ugly crops. And we love that. But if we only look to our farmers, we are only solving half of the problem. The issue with ugly vegetables is twofold. There's the farmers that can't control their ugly vegetables, and then there are consumers, and we have to look to ourselves. What are our buying behaviors? I mentioned before this habitual process of searching for the perfect tomato. For me personally, that was a difficult mindset to shift. And if it's hard for me, a co-founder of an ugly food product, it's most certainly going to be difficult for the everyday consumer. And so we knew that as a company, if we wanted to really make a difference in the ugly food movement, we would have to put education at the forefront of our company. And so when we talk to our customers, we don't just say, yeah, our produce is locally sourced. We try to have meaningful conversations with them about ugly vegetables and why they're important. But we understand it's impractical to think that we can have these conversations with every single one of our customers. And so we decided to create Ugly Vegetable Certified. 
We wear this as a badge of pride on every single one of our products to communicate to our customers not only our love of ugly vegetables, but also the importance of them and as a reinforcement of their positive buying behavior. And through our communications and our education outreach, we hope to start to change consumer buying behaviors. So although we can't speak one-on-one -on -one with every single one of our customers, they can still receive that message of our love of ugly vegetables, as well as reducing the stigma that these crops have no value. And this can have a huge impact on our local food systems, from other companies eventually becoming ugly vegetable certified, to grocery stores and markets changing their buying behavior based on consumer preference. And this would go a long way towards creating more sustainable food systems and reducing that 40% food loss statistic to 0%. And we're not alone. Since Farmented started, there have been many companies who have joined in on the ugly food movement, and we love being a part of it in such a localized way. But we don't think ugly vegetable certified just has to be related to food products. We think that every single decision that we make has an impact on the world we live in. As entrepreneurs, what problems can we help solve? As consumers, what companies do we support? And looking at the world through this lens of ugly vegetable certified is just one way of trying to make the world a better place. And we just do it with ugly vegetables. I am proud to say that over the past few years, Farmented has saved over four tons of ugly crops. But we could not have done it alone. We've had the support of our communities, of our customers, and of other business owners who have believed in our products and our mission. You can find us in grocery stores, farmers markets, farm stands and restaurants, but most importantly, you can find our products in bridges all across the state. And if you ask our customers, they don't stay in there long because they just love them so much. And I may be biased, but I have to say I agree with them. So, the next time you're on the, the quest for that perfect tomato, we ask you to think about Ugly Vegetable Certified. Ask your farmer if there's any ugly or slightly damaged produce that you can buy at the next farmer's market. Through these small yet impactful changes, you can help us, hashtag save the veggies, one ugly vegetable at a time. Thank you all so much. Well, thank you to both Vanessa's for giving our ugly vegetables at home. And just a little plug, love their garlic dills out sauerkraut. So definitely pick that up. Do you have a food here? Exactly. Yes. Farmer's market tomorrow morning if you need some um, garlic dill sauerkraut. Uh, thanks so much. So, next up, Robin. Oh, and by the way, I, I've already not been a good MC, that there are, the, the speakers are on pages that are on the table. If you're wondering who's coming next or you want to anticipate who's coming next, there's a list of the speakers on the table. So, Robin Telson is a food grower, biochemist, and attorney by training. Not sure I've ever had all of those together in one person. And a lifelong student of metaphysics and the natural world. She has a deep curiosity about human vitality and what constitutes resiliency. Her Montana-based heirloom seed company, The Good Seed Company, is dedicated to re-establishing the community practice of selecting, saving, and sharing seeds for common use because access to quality seed is central to our resilience, re resiliency both as a species and as a community. Robin recently founded the Resilience Resiliency Intelligence Institute to bring together thought leaders in resiliency thinking, supporting individuals and organizations in strategic planning and community visioning with a resiliency mindset. With a lifelong love for digging in the soil, Jen Battles is thrilled to apply her passion and skills as co-executive director of ERA. She has worked side by side with service providers, volunteers, business owners, veterans, and marginalized groups to strengthen communities, build relationships, and improve lives. She has extensive fundraising experience and an inex inexplicable fondness for organizational and planning documents, a trait she exercised in her work as an event planner, environmental educator, 
former market manager, veteran advocate, project manager, and executive director. Jen has traveled extensively in the U.S. and abroad, but has her roots under the Montana sky. She drinks tea, reads voraciously, and has been known to talk to her garden plants, as have probably a lot of us in the room. Please join me in welcoming these two exceptional women to the stage with their talk, The Future of Sustainability is Community. The theme of this conference is cultivating community resilience. And resilient communities are sustainable. Close your eyes for a moment and imagine your town, your neighborhood, your block as a finished product of community resilience in action. What do you see? What's absent? What does it sound like? What does it feel like to be at the center of it? Okay, open your eyes now. Keep that picture sharp in your mind as we share with you why Arrow believes that the future of sustainability is rooted in community and how we are engaging with Montanans like you all over the state to help create that picture of community resilience that you have in your mind. Arrow's mission is to empower communities to build a more sustainable Montana. So let's take a minute to unpack that word sustainable as we look at where Arrow is putting its focus in the next 10 years. And by the way, that's the same timeline that climate change is giving us. A sustainable system like the native prairie ecosystem on the screen means that the resources and inputs needed to run the system don't get depleted, so that the system is sustainable and is not depleted. While there are lots of important components to a sustainable, resilient community, the Arrow, we're focused on sustainable food systems. It's our niche. Food is energy, and energy is food, and we certainly can't be resilient without healthy, nourishing food. As we all know, working on food systems in Montana is a unique challenge. So what makes that challenge unique? We're a big state. Rhode Island fits 121 times in that state. We have the same size population. Continental divide, alpine forest, uh, high plains. We're a big freaking state, and there's lots of space between our communities. And we don't have many urban centers. I'm still here. But you know what makes, um, you know what, all that crazy geography makes for some resilient peoples. Montana is full of people who are problem solvers and helping hands. That screen on the right is uh, in the 2018 calling season when people came together in crazy weather to save each other's parents. And that's, um, that's what we do. We rally around what's at stake. And pivoting to find solutions can be easier to do in small communities. Arrow is built from this energy. 45 years ago, we started by building sustainable farms that grew nourishing food from renewable inputs, using landlines, cars and newsletters, sharing resources, lending tools. It produced amazing results. All sorts of value grew from this work, including ways to support connecting these food system pillars to each other, like distribution and processing, for example, adding news reds to the food system fabric. Some are directly related to Arrow, and many, many more are offshoots from this original work, the links to which we may never know. Just looking through the institutional lens, at MSU, uh, Bruce Maxwell created the space for the Institute on Ecosystems in the first ever Montana Climate Assessment, which we just heard about. Mary Stein created the space for Fermented, which we just heard about. Neva Hassanin helped create space for Grow Montana and UMT's Campus Dining Initiative, all of which have added untold threats to the fabric. So for sustainable food systems, here's a graphic that provides an easy way to grow up the system with elements or pillars that are linked in a circle. We've got five pillars in this one, production, processing, distribution, consumption, and recovery. Other graphics might have other pillars. But regardless, this image is really actually not how the system works. In reality, there are multiple points of contact between each pillar out to every other part of the system. Distributors certainly deal directly with waste and recovery, and of course can work directly with producers, and producers obviously work directly with consumers, be they CSA uh, customers, restaurants, farmers markets or stores. All of these points of contact make a network. So that fabric that we spoke about weaving together, it's actually a network. And a network is the fastest way to communicate change and information. It's true in resilient systems in nature, including the soil fungus, and it's also true for sustainable Montana systems, enhancing multiple points of contact. And guess what? That is Arrow's sweet spot. With all the work that we have collectively done to enhance food systems in Montana, folks in the pillars can still feel alone when they're trying to grow food, distribute food, or access food. At the very least, it's exhausting to try to do it all alone, and it's not sustainable. So Arrow's focus on enhancing the support in these, on these points of contact. And it's not just our pillars that can feel siloed. In this time of increased te technological connection, more and more of us are feeling isolated and alone. 
and that's not sustainable or resilient. Aero is investing and connecting people to each other and their community because it's people that make up the network. It's people in connection that make the food system alive. So this is where Aero is putting its focus now, on enhancing the network that connects the pillars, the fabric of the food system. For one thing, it's what we're good at. We're conveners and community engagers. And this is a people network. For another thing, enhancing the network is a key to the system's vitality and viability. Without it, those systems will remain silent and the system just won't run. Our 10-year vision for enhancing the system includes three programs designed to strengthen the system, empower communities, and be demonstrative, have tangible, measurable results on the system. Our target participants include community members, future thought leaders, and established support institutions like Extension, hospitals, schools, county sanitarians, and grocers. Our first program is mobilizing communities to enact systems level change. How are we gonna do that? By reducing barriers for communities to take action. Connecting communities with concrete tools in the form of mini grants, assistance with technology, planning, assessment, evaluation, evidence-based strategies, training, meeting facilitation, research, and partnership building. Our second program is a leadership training and certificate program that's co-created with people working in the field, including a farmer-led curriculum. It will develop leaders with on-the-ground experience educated in the nuance of food systems and the value of the network. Our third program is a school to farm and an internship experience. Aero farmers and skilled interns will co-create projects that add value to the farm and the farm's points of contact with local food system network. We'll share all of the outcomes in an online Aero hub providing resources for you to adapt and use. And we're gonna do this Aero style. Yes. Because that's who we are. We're conveners and community engagers. So we'll still be doing our wild dinners and expo and all our other programs that bring people together. We are investing in the human community. And each of you is a part of that community. This is an invitation for you to join the Arrow family, to get reconnected, to help the food system thrive, and to bring your vision of community resilience to life. Thank you. Thank you, Robin and Jen, for that overview of Arrow and for the reminder, um, and I'm a big community person as well, just in terms of what it takes uh, to build a resilient system. Our next speaker is Danielle Antelope. She's the co-chair of Fast Blackbeat and graduated from Blackbeat Community College in 2018 with an AS in Health Science and an AS in Math and Science. She is currently here at MSU pursuing a degree in Sustainable Foods and Bioenergy Systems. Danielle is a full-time student doing undergraduate research on behalf of Fast Blackfeet, looking into other native food pantries and their sustainability, challenges, successes, and advice they have. She is also currently serving as a student step senator for the College of Education, Health, and Human Development. In Danielle's free time, she enjoys playing, cooking, and reading with her four-year-old son, Jace. And, according to one of her advisors here at MSU, Danielle is a natural storyteller who's using her power, the power of her voice to lead important food systems change in her community of Browning. She's only in her early 20s, and she's emerged as a humble leader and change maker, and is raising the awareness here at MSU about the many food and health challenges in Indian country. MSU, we wanted you to know that MSU is so fortunate to have Danielle part of their community. Please join me in welcoming this amazing community leader to the stage with her talk, The Change of Native Food Systems and the Purpose of Fast Black Feet. Before I start and my time starts, I just wanted to point out that Fast Black Feet stands for Food Access Sustainability Team Black Feet. So I use that in my slide sheet. Okay. I'm ready, Kate. What do I get these things to? Okay, and still a stance in Nedanagu, Daniel Antelope, Nitsadapi, Asita, Nitsadapi, Amaskapi Bikani. Hello, my name is Daniel. Uh, hello, my name is Comes and Singing. I am called Daniel Antelope. I'm from Browning and I am Amaskapi Bikani. Today, I want to share with you the story of my family's food system, and I'll do this by telling you the story of seven generations. In 1930, my great-grandmother returned from boarding school to be raised in traditional ways by her grandmother. 
She knew the plants, the language, the songs, the ceremonies, and the way of life. As she raised her children, she felt the need to protect them by limiting the traditional knowledge that she passed down. Each generation, the traditional knowledge that was passed down decreased, and I decided to be a part of the generation that breaks that cycle and relearns what my grandmothers knew. Jace is my pride and joy, and he represents our seventh generation. I am breaking the cycle of fear by reintroducing traditional foods, language, dance, and becoming ways of knowing back into his life. Originally across North America, there were thousands of tribes, and today there are 573 federally recognized tribes left. These tribes across the nation share common knowledge, such as coexisting with the land rather than dominating the land. Each of these tribes existed in a food system that was determined by their location. For example, the Eastern Woodland tribes relied upon the ancient Three Sisters method, the combination of corn, beans, and squash. Today, Western science acknowledges the importance of this plant relationship. In the Great Lakes region, these tribes relied on harvesting of wild rice and freshwater fish. In fact, today, traditional harvesting practices are still happening in this region. Each of these food systems that I'm sharing support a nutritious diet. In the Northwest Pacific, these tribes were known as the most bountiful tribes, with the ocean on one side and the forest and freshwater on the other side. This allowed them to have an abundant and diverse food system. Through their abundance, they were recognized for sharing with other tribes in times of scarcity. The region that I know most about and is the setting for my family's story is the Northern Great Plains. Our traditional territory was a vast area and allowed for the harvesting of foods from a variety of landscapes. But please recognize that this dark section on the map is a comparatively tiny land area that my people were forced onto following colonization. The region, oh, within this large land area, we were able to follow the buffalo's migration patterns. The buffalo provided us with more than just food, but also clothing, shelter, and tools. The traditional diet of my people is buffalo, wild game, and over 200 plants used for food, medicine, and ceremony. Together, these foods made up a complete nutritional diet that supported health and well-being. The physical exercise needed for our hunting and gathering was also important for our health. This all came to a screeching halt when the U.S. government made the intentional decision to destroy our food source. They made the decision that it was cheaper to starve us than to continue to fight us. The loss of the buffalo was the single most detrimental shift in my family's food system. Next came the agreement that if Native people stayed on their assigned reservations, then the U.S. government would provide them with food. But this food was not their traditional food. These foods included flour, oil, sugar, beef, milk, and processed cheese. And with new food, came new health issues and diseases. In my family, like many other Native families, I have seen the repercussions of this drastically changed food system. My grandmother had type two, type, type 2 diabetes and had amputations due to it. She had nine children, and of those nine children, eight have diabetes, including my mother. This change was not our choice, and it's a hard history to face. But I realized I have a choice of remaining angry or taking that anger and translating it into action. And that's exactly what we do at Fast Black Feet. At Fast Black Feet, we are guided by the triple E's. We educate, engage, and empower, both within our home community and at opportunities like this PK talk tonight. The best way for people to understand the need for healthy change is to understand the history one way that we are making change is by starting with a food access assessment. One of the questions that we asked was to name three traditional foods 
What you see is an infographic that shows the results of these responses. And this told us that our community doesn't understand the difference between traditional foods and survival foods. Traditional foods are our original foods, and survival foods are the foods that our grandmothers had to survive off of in order for us to be here today. This speaks to the need for us to continue to educate, educate about our original healthy food system and regaining food sovereignty. We can't just talk about healthier foods. We have to incorporate these changes into our daily lives by eating our traditional foods and drinking our medicinal teas. Fast Blackfeet understands that in order to one day have food sovereignty, we first need to have access to healthy and culturally relevant foods. And we can ultimately live within a food system that supports this. Our vision at Fast Blackfeet is a healthy, strong, and food secure Blackfeet nation. Good afternoon, and I hope to see you again. already I'm very hopeful these are the types of, event, of events that make me very hopeful uh, about our future so thank you Danielle <coughs> next up um, some of my favorite farmers in the valley uh, JC Roschiller owns and operates the diverse Gallatin Valley Botanical at Rocky Creek Farm a special piece of land on the edge of Bozeman that produces vegetables flowers meat fruit community events and memories she has been farming since 2003, but she has spent her life growing plants. She is passionate about growing all things, especially her two sprouts, Zachary and Anya. <laughs> Zachary Rochiller is a 13-year-old curious boy who has spent his life working on the farm alongside his parents. Zachary enjoys taking care of the animals, swimming, swimming in the river, and eating berries in the midst of summer. This last summer, he helped lead the kids' farm camp and rode his bike around the farm. He loves the farm and his dogs. Let's give a warm welcome to some great farmers in this valley, mother and son duo, JC and Zach. I love 
of berries. And veggies are just old friends. We've been growing them for 17 years. But so, in the end, my favorite is starting all the seedlings. My favorite thing in the end is carrots. They're easy to grow, harvest, there's a lot of them, and they taste delicious. <laughs> One job that I love is planting garlic. We plant garlic from our own stock in October. So as the season is winding down, everything is dying, and you aren't really sure if you made it financially, but with optimism and hope, you push clothes into the ground and say, I'm going to do this again next year. And I chose this picture because it was Zachary on my back. I love how we take care of the new baby animals that we get, such as piglets, chicks, baby chickens, and other baby animals like lambs. We often have hard times. We tried to birth piglets before. It wasn't very fun. <laughs> my favorite tool on the farm are greenhouses. In Montana, um, we use heated greenhouses and non-heated high pump mobile high tunnels. Um, we use them for summer and winter, uh, for in-ground production. We grow microgreens and our seedlings in the greenhouses and it's uh, the indispensable tool for Montana. My favorite tool is this truck. Because <laughs> 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 it was in a hay fire from a spark from a generator. And I like it because I get more freedom and mobility around the farm. When we were originally brainstorming, it was supposed to be the hardest thing on the farm. But as we went along, we changed it to the most fun thing. Often, my hardest times are followed by a swim in the river at the end of the day with my family, a chance to cool down, have an attitude adjustment, and be playful with my kids. And it's even better after GPLP help. I particularly like going out at dusk in summertime because there's it's a nice environment, and I get alone time, which I don't get much of on the farm. But I get on the farm all the time, and that's nice. Uh, a favorite memory of mine is raising little bottle pig. He was the run of the litter and was stepped on by his mom, and the kitten I had to give him eyedroppers full of milk every hour for the first few days. And then he followed us around like a dog, doing all the chores, and that was a fun memory. And fun. Yeah, <laughs> my favorite memory is growing up on the farm. We lived in the bunkhouse for a few years, and we moved around a lot. And then when we were in the bunkhouse, we were eating out of the greenhouse, which was our kitchen, and we also grew stuff in there. My favorite thing to cook on the farm is with winter squash. Here I am with a bunch of winter squash. Um, I love roasting delicata by itself with, or with other root vegetables. I love baking in kabocha or making a long pie pumpkin soup. My favorite recipe has to be by far this garlic recipe that I've come up with. Um, I use garlic scapes, carrots, cucumbers, whatever, we, whatever herb we have on here. And you put them with some hot oil in a skillet and fry them up, and they taste delicious. And everything is infused with garlic. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I'm most proud of is my perseverance, grit, and determination that has helped us farm for 17 years, and our ability to jump into new things. The proudest thing I um, of a Zachary is that he has persevered right along with us. He has, yes, lived in bunk houses, built and remodeled houses, raised animals that don't always live, and the picture doesn't look like grit, but it's <laughs> apples are a new thing. <laughs> and I'm proud of being able to tell my parents, and this summer we worked to set up a teepee. It took a little while, and we ran out of coal, so we had to make our make do with what we had, and we had enough, and I'm proud of my mom for being able to persevere through everything. In the future, I hope to continue working towards creating a place where Zachary, my family, our employees, our community can come together to learn, explore, and celebrate around our culture that embraces healthy food, hard work, and each other. In the future, I'd like to 
we grow a lot of things, but I don't like want to grow more things. I want to grow the things we do grow more efficiently so we get more crop and we get higher quality and more efficiency. Thank you. <laughs>
These were some of the most commonly cited in surveys done by groups like the National Young Farmers Coalition, um, that people were really having difficulty getting on the land um, or getting secure land tenure. And so this probably has to do with, we're facing farmland loss around the United States. And so um, a lot of times, it's just difficult to get farmland because it's expensive, given that there's less of it, and people end up as tenants rather than landowners. And as tenants, maybe don't have as much control over what they can do on that land, or making like, permanent investments in conservation infrastructure, or even investing in soil health if you're not sure you're going to be there three years, five years down the line. And then another major barrier that we heard about was accessing capital, credit, insurance, the financial tools that people needed. Um, and in some farming systems, there's a lot of upfront capital necessary. And so this could be a huge barrier for people trying to access agriculture as a profession is just getting started. Um, and then the, the terrible part about this is that even though beginning farms represent 22% of farms, they only receive 9% of government direct payments. So the people who most need the capital that's coming out of our public systems are not accessing it even in um, you know as much as they represent agriculture, the, the portion of agriculture they represent. But another barrier that I think is going to become increasingly important is, is this barrier around water um, and thinking about how we're all, will our um, legal systems, our, our water rights need to evolve um, to help ensure that new entry sustainable farmers can be viable and to think about how we're distributing the water that we have um, to realize the vision of a food system that we want for the future. Uh, this is definitely something that comes up a lot in California right now, um, and also urban and rural water conflicts. So again, you know, just going into three of these in detail, but just to say that, gosh, this is a lot to be up against as somebody looking to enter sustainable agriculture, um, whether as a young person or uh, as a second career or as someone who's immigrated here with an agrarian background. So what can we do about it? Um, the good news is there are a lot of programs that exist. Some have been brought up um, even this evening that exist at state levels, local levels, even federal levels. Um, the challenging thing that we heard from a lot of folks in agriculture was that there were these different pockets of support and it became this really difficult job for them to connect all those things up into something that looks like a sort of holistic support network. So are there existing solutions? Yes. So this is this, I sort of intentionally made this kind of overwhelming chart. Yes, there's a lot up there. <laughs> um, but figuring out how to put these things together to address each of these barriers around land and capital and water and tools can be challenging. So how can they be interconnected? So in some cases, we have programs that work across multiple levels. So you might have the USDA Transitions Incentive Program at the federal level that would work with these state incentives. You might then be on nonprofit land trust land um, and have these various kind of local business models. All those things might come together to, in a holistic way, support viability for a new producer. But there's still gaps, as you might imagine, in a system like this that the individuals entering agriculture are kind of having to patchwork together for themselves. Um, so it's leaving people out, and again, it's systematically leaving certain people out, right? So how can we create more aspirational policies that really are designed to be holistic from the beginning? And I think that's an opportunity that I'm excited about. Um, there are more and more groups talking about this on a national level, talking about how my agriculture figure in a Green New Deal, and really thinking more holistically about we must support this next generation of sustainable farmers because the world that we really all want to see very much in these people's hands. So thank you so much to all of you doing this work, all of you supporting this work. I'm so excited to be here this weekend and um, very much looking forward to hearing from uh, the wisdom of the youth. I love the theme tonight, so thank you. Thanks so much, Liz. I feel like we need more than a six minute and 40 second talk to cover everything that you covered. Are you gonna write a book about this? <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Great. So our next speaker is Jeff Batten. Jeff is a co-founder and principal at Home State Venture Partners. He has also served and still does in both full and part-time positions for many well-known startups and fast growth enterprises around the state. Jeff is a serial entrepreneur with over 20 years of proven success in creating enterprise value and developing high-impact teams. 
He has experience in most executive roles in many industries with a particular expertise in entrepreneurial finance. He has had direct involvement with more than 200 million in funding for startups and other businesses in the Northwest, including some of the best funded startups in Montana. He also has corporate finance experience where he has shared responsibility for $15 billion of institutional capital. Whenever possible, Jeff seeks the intersection between high profitability and socially responsible products and business practices. Let's welcome Jeff to the stage, giving us the very important financial piece of the food systems puzzle with his talk, Venture versus Collaborative Capital, How and Why Local Ownership Can and Should Be Accomplished. Hi, everybody. Uh, so I promise there's a punchline in here that gets back to ag when it's all said and done, but I'm going to go kind of way off road what we've been talking about so far. So I'm ready. Go for it. So, uh, as Kareem just introduced me, I've, done, I've worked with a lot of different companies in town over the last 20 years, um, helping them attract the capital of the company. It's a difficult thing with a lot of puzzle pieces. There's a lot of things you have to answer. I have become a self-certified financial geek and sort of business geek around this. And my, folk, or my family tells me, calm down sometimes. That's the point of that. Math, I think, similar to everybody else speaking tonight, stands for Make America Think Harder. And I think that in our case, when it comes to finances, there's a lot, uh, there's a lot that happens behind the scenes that people don't think about, and I want, you to, I want to ask you to think about it. Um, you know, Montana's got this history, sorry the ugly slide, but Montana's got a history of extraction, right? That's what the business here is all about. It's been mined drive through the boot, you understand what that's all about. You read the story of Montana Power and hear how a lot of retirees lost their net worth, um, all based on decisions made elsewhere. Um, you know, point of this is exactly what it says. Let's be careful, uh, let's think harder. Because guess what, that stuff that sounds old, what I just talked about, and that kind of compromise was 100 years ago, right? But just a couple of years ago, just here in Bozeman, one of our greatest successes supposedly in the startup community was a company that got venture capital funding from outside sources, grew up, got an IPO done, got bought by Oracle, and oh, lo and behold, laid off 100 people. Um, you know, so, so several people from that got fabulously wealthy, 100 people got laid off. We don't think that that's exactly where we ought to be going. We think that the Lone Ranger has been sort of held up as like, this is what the venture capital industry and sort of private equity stands for. It's like, here they come to our rescue. My question is, is, you know, why is it that we've set them up as hero status? All they're really doing is bringing outsized money and colonizing us yet again. And, you know, so, so an example of that, Shark Tank, really, really held up on this pedestal. It's a great show that everybody watches, right? Every time I turn it on, I see people making entrepreneurs cry. It doesn't seem like how we ought to be treating entrepreneurs in our country and in our communities. Um, yet, that's what we do. Why is that? It's because these guys are essentially looking for home runs. If you have a regular business, is what I would quote unquote call it, good luck getting venture capital. It's not likely to happen. Um, you know, literally one half of 1% of any company ever will get venture capital. And it's because they're looking for things, like on this slide, another ugly one, sorry, that create monopolies, create a lot of extraction of economies like what Amazon has done in Main Street businesses all across this country. It's a, it's a, that's what they're looking for. Literally, they're setting out looking for something that is literally going to make billions and billions of dollars. So then we all wonder, why is it that I can't get through to the customer service line? Well, guess what? It's because the, the system is set up to create efficiency. So rather than you know, looking at hard work and rewarding hard work and, and a, a lifetime's worth of work, the idea is how do we just squeeze out of this existing system? So this is a map. Try to hold this in your hand. There's no way I'm going to get through, through this in 20 seconds. But this is the minor leagues up, or, or I'm sorry, the farm teams up to the minor leagues up to Wall Street. We're all part of this. This is all part of the problem is that we all are investors in this. When we write a check to our IRA or whatever, we're supporting this idea of aggregating capital, just like we've aggregated farms, we've aggregated capital. Um, so doom and gloom, I'm done. I'm gonna turn the corner here, we're gonna talk about more fun things. 
um, which is, you know, what can we do about it? And, you know, the good news is that there's a lot of headlines floating around these days. Um, things like Fast Company, which is a, you know, legitimate media outlet, has this, this month actually, capitalism is dead, wait a minute, long live capitalism. I mean, the idea is capitalism is good, but maybe we've let it get a little out of control and maybe we need to think about ways to bring it back into control. There's a lot of great thinking going on in that now. You know, our way of thinking is we need to turn around the power paradigm. For too long, it's been capital has gets the vote, right? It's, it's sort of a, a heads I win, tails you lose kind of a concept when it comes to capital. And instead, we want to think about dolphin tank, I and mean, we kind of joke about it, but we're not really joking. You know, we want to support people and what they're doing. So what we're trying to accomplish here in Bozeman and across the state is to move away from this monolithic thing that you see here, something similar that I'm sure you've all thought of in, in agriculture. It's all fulcrum on top of Wall Street. How about we break that apart? Let's get back to community-based investing. And the funny thing is, we used to have that, right? So community banks, that's what this chart is. Community banks from 1966 to today. It has been a bloodbath, right? These companies have all been bought up, and now all of the decisions get made in, who knows where, New York or San Francisco primarily, right? And so what we're trying to do is recreate in a different way, I don't really want to run a bank, but we're creating a new approach that tries to go after that big white space where nobody is getting any capital. Sometimes it's an ag, sometimes it's not for us, um, but you know the idea is that community banking 2.0 might be something that we need to all think about. What's that mean? It means we need to roll up our sleeves. That's where collaborative capital comes from. We need to meet with the business owners. We need to talk about what do you need, right? So the problem with banks is it's one size fits all. The problem with venture capitalists is it's all one size fits all. Well, we don't do that. We try to come at it from a perspective of what do you need, and then let's try to solve how we get that for you. Um, so our, our idea, and the thing that I want to ask help for, all, from all of you for, is similar to what uh, Vanessa was saying earlier. We get to decide this. Right? It's our money. And so what I want to say to you is that there are ways that you can invest locally. There are ways that you can take investment from local investors. And we're trying to create that network, that infrastructure. I mean, a lot of the things that we've been talking about here tonight fit. Um, punchline is that there's several ag-related companies on this slide. It's probably not going to stay up long enough for you to see it. But, um, you know, I think of the roughly 15 or 20 investments we've done so far, Five or six of them are, are either directly ag or, or food related. So um, I guess that's it. I appreciate your time. Thanks for everybody for, for listening. And uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Jeff. I think that financial piece is something that I certainly don't pay attention to enough. And the idea of relocalizing is so important. So last, we come to the last. Uh, talk of the evening. Uh, Dr. Ricardo Salvador is the director of the Union of Concerned Scientists Food and Environment Program and works with people, scientists, economists, and politicians to transition our current food system into one that grows healthy foods while employing sustainable and socially equitable practices. Previously at the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, he partnered with colleagues to create programs addressing ties between food, health, environment, economic development, sovereignty, and social justice. At Iowa State University, he worked with students to establish a student-operated farm with faculty colleagues to develop the nation's first graduate-level sustainable agriculture program and oversaw some of the original academic research on community-supported agriculture. He's also worked as the extension agent with Texas A&M, and in 2014, he was awarded the James Beard Foundation Leadership Award for his work in advocacy in support of healthy and equitable food systems. He is a member of the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Foods. We just wanted to give a huge thanks to Dr. Bruce Maxwell and the MSU Institute on Ecosystems for bringing Dr. Salvador to MSU, and to Dr. Salvador for boiling down your thoughts into a single talk lasting under seven minutes. So please join me in giving a warm Montana welcome to Dr. Ricardo Salvador.
that I have two Japanese architects to blame for the predicament that I'm in. <laughs> but I'm very thankful to Aero and uh, to Bruce and the Japan Institute for assistance uh, for being here and to uh, listen to all the wisdom that's been shared this evening. I um, very much want to get up to Montana. I'm a big admirer of Aero and the work that Bruce is doing and the price that I have to pay is to do two talks for that, and the price that you have to pay is to put up with those two talks. And uh, I was thinking about this uh, PK format, and something that very politely has not been said about it is that a virtue of it is that if you get a dud, you don't have to wait too long to come over. So you'll uh, so see that here in just uh, six minutes. How bad can it be that's tested? Okay, so. Um, I understand that what we want to do here is to give the youngest generation venturing into agriculture and food um, some suggestions for a vision that is different than the history of agriculture to this moment. And the unusual twist that I want to take to this narrative is to say that when we say we, we really need to think deeply about who we are. So the system that we have at the moment really can honestly be called one that is a result of an effort of a prior generation having the opportunity to build their utopia. So some of us, according to who we are and how we experience the system, call them settlers. Some of them call them colonists. You see that here this evening as well. The system that they set up is in the world dramatically different from the one in which we live right now. For one, it was very real at the time that they lived, that you could treat the environment as almost an infinite source of resources and almost an infinite place where you could get rid of your wastes. So that's hardwired into our behavior, and by now it is outdated. Benjamin Franklin thought that the only way in which nations could increase their wealth was through agriculture, and he described it as the miracle of throwing a seed into the ground and a kind of a continual miracle wrought by the hand of God in his favor as a reward for his innocent life and virtuous industry, that being the farmer. And at his time, we didn't understand the way that plants work, the way that nature worked, the way that animals worked. An institution like this one was set up to actually figure those things out, but it represented public investment on behalf of certain people. There were some people who were not welcome at these institutions deliberately. And I'll come back to this. But as a result of 160 years of investment, we now know about biogeochemical cycles. We now know that it is possible to operate agriculture in a restorative way, to regenerate nutrients, to build up soil. We know that that's possible. We understand the theory of that. We also all can articulate a vision for a system where we save the cost of cleaning up water, dredging rivers by farming in such a way that we actually don't erode the soil, that we actually have clean water, that we don't have to clean it up in order to be able to have sources of uh, municipal drinking water and so on and that is a safe place to recreate. We understand conceptually that this is a possibility. We also understand conceptually that we want a food system that is authentically nourishing in the sense that if we eat what the food system provides for us three times a day when we get hungry over the course of our lifetime, it won't make us sick, it won't help us to thrive. So that the longer years of our life are actually lives that we want to live, that we can actually enjoy. However, we need to think, as I said at the outset, about who we is when we talk all of these different visions. Because the system explicitly, as we've heard this evening, was not set up for all of us. As a matter of fact, a very real aspect of the system as we set it up is that it was only for some of us. The Department of Labor actually uh, classifies by ethnicity the major occupations in the land. And as you see, Farming is the second whitest occupation. Not just slightly white, it is 96% white. In a country where a little bit less than 60% of the population is white, that doesn't just happen. And this famous drawing, Manifest Destiny, that you're all familiar with, you see lightness, civilization, technology moving in with whiteness from the left, replacing darkness on the opposite side, where we have the native population, their food system, as we've just heard, all being eliminated. And this is a phase that Ira Katzenelson has referred to as the phase when affirmative action was white. When educational systems were set up exclusively for some of us, when access to credit was favorable for only some of us, when access to education in particular was 
uh, a way in which some of us could begin to build our wealth, and so on. And so the resulting system, uh, it should be very plain to all of us, regardless of where we sit in the present, was one in which some of us were the beneficiaries, and some of us were just around to, first of all, that provided the land where this took place, to provide the labor that turned that land and the menial tasks into capital and building wealth. And we need to transform that, if we really believe the principles on which the country was founded, into a system that actually recognizes that all of this is a result of our collectivity, our land, our labor, our ingenuity, our efforts that all ended up giving us the system that we have right now. So if you really want that, one of the things to recognize is that it began by reapportioning land, a major land grab that we uh, just turned around and gave away. And so we need to think seriously about land reform. We need to be bold about the first factor of production, which is how we begin to build all other sorts of wealth. And it's particularly important, as we just heard, for those that are thinking about getting into food and agriculture. We also need to rethink the way in which we believe that we get access to the system by creating systems where all of us have the wealth to be able to pay the real price of what it takes to produce the food and not to work on paying less and squeezing the producers for what they're producing. We need to be able to all pay what it actually costs to produce that food. So you may be familiar with the notion of paid ecosystem services as a corrective to that hardwired antiquated system that was ideated back in the middle of the 18th century. Why are we surprised that we optimize yield at the moment? Because that's what we pay for. It shouldn't be a shock. Paid ecosystem services is the remedy in the sense that we shouldn't expect farmers to be altruists for everything but yield and to pay them for ecosystem goods. We also need to think about what the face of agriculture looks like particularly in view of some of the history that we've had reviewed for us tonight. It would not have been the natural course of history unless we specifically excluded some people from participating in the story. The status quo represents the interest of a food system that is worth about a trillion dollars. That means that there's a trillion dollars that says it's going to stay the way that it is right now. There's a saying in D.C. that says that if the only way that Congress or anybody in government is going to listen to you is if you're either one of two things, the money or the many. So as the many, I want to talk particularly to the young among you who are going to be the future of the system to pursue a vision that was articulated by probably one of the most American uh, prototypes that you can think of, Walt Disney, which was to say, let us think, let us vision, let us dream, and let us dare to come up with a system that in reality is different than the history of the system to the moment. And that is changing who we are when we think about what we want for the future.